Hello ladies and gentlemen, and in today's video we're going to be talking about wedding photography with a very special guest. I'll see you after this. Hello there. Uh, so in the past, I've been I've made videos which uh, is about the, the business of photography, and I wanted to take that a little stage further in today's videos. And we're talking to a very good friend of mine and the channel, and somebody else who is a YouTuber as well. I'll leave a channel link in the description. Um, John Sparkman. John, hello. How are you? <laughs> hello, Steve. How are you doing? I'm I'm very well. It's. Uh... Lovely day outside. It's summertime. Finally. It is summertime. We've we've had British summertime, which three days and then it rains. <laughs> it's yes, right. I think it's due to rain later. So you know. <laughs> yes, more than likely. Um, but wedding photography. Now you've been doing wedding photography for how long now? Uh, so I did my first wedding in about 2012. Mm -hmm. Uh, but realistically, I started going uh, more professionally or more consistently since 2014. And so it's been going ever since. So yeah, absolutely love it. And we did just you touch on this just before we get what with COVID and everything. When was the last wedding that you did? Oh, the last. So the last wedding I did was uh, I think it was October 2019, and my next one is Saturday, which is June 2021. So have you? Fa I mean, I know because I've got family who are thinking about getting married and things. Uh, I mean, mostly they're thinking about the things. Um, I know that there's this pressure on people to to keep with the wedding preparations they've already got, and there's other pressures yeah. to get rid of it so that you know the the uncle who has to fly in can come and actually go to the wedding. How are you finding bookings at the moment? Is it starting to pick up again, or is it yeah. still pretty dead? Or yeah, so um, when the the last uh, lockdown restriction was kind of eased, uh, kind of May 2021. Uh, I then suddenly just started to get traffic. Like I, I was doing nothing different. I was on the referral sites and Instagram and sure. vendors, and just suddenly I was getting uh, kind of inquiries everywhere. Like I would go onto my Instagram and I'd find just random messages from people who weren't even um, following my account saying, "Are you free on this date? Free on this date?" And they're all dates which are two months away, three months away, right. a week away. Right. Uh, so they've all kind of. People have had to sh reshuffle and change, and you know potentially. I suppose their they're looking for people at the last minute, are they? Is that that's? Yeah, it's, it's last minute. There's there's not too many currently booking for say two years away, which is pretty much normal, but all very very last minute. So yeah, I'm, 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 you know trying to help out where I can. <laughs> so you said that uh, that you know two years away is pretty normal. If somebody mm. wants to kind of ed enter the wedding photography field, yeah, what sort of things should they be looking out for? for you know, first time wedding photographers. Mm. Should they be thinking, well, okay, weddings in two years' time, what am I going to do in the interim? Or is it a case that they can get bookings for stuff earlier on than that? Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. So um, my, my advice for someone who's trying to get in and do their first wedding is to not do your first wedding alone. Um, <laughs> I've absolutely. heard this before, yeah. But yeah, the problem, well, not the problem, the, the hard facts about weddings are is you get one chance to do all of it once. Uh, and the expectation is there to do it all perfectly first time. Yeah. Now, before you get to that stage, it's advisable to either uh, shadow someone else who's doing photography, just be their assistant, pick up their bags for the days. It's hard work, but you will learn by seeing what they do. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, spending time with uh, models, hiring people to put on wedding dresses and try and, you know, create a portfolio in advance. Uh, it's, if you're in the lucky circumstance where you've already had someone approach you for a wedding, then you need to have the real world experience beforehand. But if you're trying to get your first wedding, you need to have a comprehensive portfolio before that starts. People aren't just going to go, you're a photographer, you're hired. I have so, mentioned this on I the wish. channel before. <laughs> Weddings are one thing that I just will not touch. I, I've yeah. videoed one wedding when I wasn't even doing video. I, you know, I was the the person who had a video camera at the time. Uh, oh, so wow. I videoed yeah, exactly. one wedding, and I just don't want to go anywhere near it because it is that that kind of a big day for people. So what other pressures do you think uh, are on wedding photographers in particular? Uh, during the the, the 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 actual day, and of course before before and after as well. Before and after, um, I, th I think it's and it's more of a it's more of a, a recent reflection on kind of how good technology is that 
30 years ago when my dad was a photographer, 40 years ago even, sorry, <laughs> I forgot what year we are in. 40 years ago, my dad was a photographer. It was very much, uh, if you've got a camera and you know how to shoot, you can shoot weddings and make a profession out of it. Nowadays, because literally everything we own has cameras on it now, smartphones, iPads, sure. uh, you know, mirrorless cameras, digital SLR cameras are not that expensive compared to other things nowadays. The amount of people who can shoot photography is huge. It's not a, it's not a niche anymore to have a camera. So what you're up against essentially is trying to differentiate yourself from the masses that have the ability to take a photograph and the skill set you have as a photographer to, to make them better, more interesting, uh, have your niche in it. So it, it's very much the entire kind of marketing process for myself, especially is showing this is what it would look like as a normal kind of just a snap almost. And this is what it looks like when you've applied, you know, 10 years of studio photography, lighting experience, camera knowledge, editing. Uh, and kind of get, getting the the couples essentially to to bridge that gap themselves. I think that's where the the, the key is nowadays. And and what do you think that the uh, you know how how do you, do you distinguish? I mean, not necessarily yourself, but how would one distinguish themselves as a unique photographer in this space? Yeah, well, uh, I've always said you can be three kinds of things. You can be better, cheaper, or different. And you don't want to be cheaper. To, so it's a better or different, um, and I think a lot of a lot of people, especially maybe um, art styled photographers or kind of you know experimental photographers, they will try and do their style, yeah, and um, ha create a real nice niche. And you may get some bookings because of your niche, mm -hmm. but what really makes it is understanding what the couple are looking for in a photographer right? and meeting those concerns, answering those questions, bridging kind of uh, any troubles they have. Because I think ultimately um, it's, better to be a, it's better to be a wedding photographer who is okay at photography and good at business than the other way around. Sure, sure. Because uh, you can be the absolute best photographer in the world, but if no one knows where you are online or no one knows how to contact you or you haven't got a website, they're not going to get the bookings. Um, so it, it's you know it's it's a lot less photography than you think to be a wedding photographer. Sadly, that's just that's just the truth. Uh, you know, in Hard in truth. other businesses, I know that there is a sort of the, the eighty twenty rule, the the Pareto principle, it's called, uh, where eighty percent of uh, your income comes from twenty percent of your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and similarly, eighty percent of your time will be wasted. Uh, whereas twenty percent of it will be absolutely completely productive. Is that yeah. the same in in mm -hmm. w with weddings? And what are what are the things? Uh, what are the pitfalls of uh, that, that you can get caught in in doing that that isn't actually bringing you work in, but is you know, as some you know one of those time sinks? Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah that that's um, <laughs> that's a deep question. That is so. Um, it wasn't what I wrote down I, before the, the thing started either. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so, p from personal experience, I've found, and um, because I've been doing it since like 2012, uh, social media is very divisive right. on uh, um, if you rely on it for your business. Mm -hmm. I know some fantastic photographers who they only have an Instagram with 10,000 followers yeah. and they get bookings through there. I also know people who will pour money into their Instagram. Well, their Facebook ads and it would go nowhere. Mm. Um, I, I feel that people's focus on social media can be potentially too much. Like they're not focusing on where they need to be. Uh, I also think that the key to growing business is uh, repeat business, pretty much all yeah. referrals. Yeah, essentially. Of course. Yeah. Like it's not going to be repeat weddings. People aren't going to get <laughs> going to book you twice. <laughs> hopefully for a wedding. Uh, so referrals. So it's how you come across as a person to people how you come across as a person to other vendors at your weddings, uh, getting in with um, venues to do their photography or to give them a nice free album to give and give and give. Right. And then all they have to do is say, oh, we've got a great photographer, uh, John. And then you immediate booking. Didn't have to do anything afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So it's more about client relationships and less about how many followers you have on Instagram. That word of mouth thing, I think, is really, really important. I don't, I don't think you can, uh, you can, you can help, but um, yeah, 
benefit from from word of mouth. Uh, it it's the way local businesses survive. Uh, it always has been. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. in terms of you know once you you've shot the wedding, hmm. what do you actually give to people? What how how do you how do you provide the photos? What is, what is it that you're you're giving? You know, do, you do, do you do the whole online thing or do you um, uh, just provide prints? Uh, yeah, well, um, I am a little bit. I'm a little bit old school. My first uh, kind of job out of university was in a printing lab, so mm -hmm. I've always liked printing photos and uh, books and things like that. And I've also seen the progression of digital media. So I've seen it kind of uh, replace print, and then digital media is now starting to kind of phase out towards kind of cloud-based yes. uh, storage. So primarily, um, I will supply uh, the couple or whoever I'm, I'm booking with. The best shots, a fifth or uh, or so of generally what I've taken in RAW, and it'd be an online gallery. Uh, and this online gallery is password protected. There's download links. It stays online for a year or two, and they can share that out with you know family, friends, order prints. It's it's a nice little ecosystem where they can just have a little access to. But more and more often, people go for uh, kind of albums and uh, prints and things like this. And it's just it's just a nice way because. You know, in 20 years' time, you don't know where computer storage is going to be. You don't yeah, know if that's cloud true. is still going to be a thing then. You don't know if uh, USB ports are going to go away and you can't <laughs> plug in a USB <laughs> stick in anywhere. I used to... Well, uh, I was saying, my... you know, th there must be people who have had their weddings put on DVD and they can't have yep. a DVD player. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at my old job, we used to convert uh, cine film, so old little rolls of film, and it would be people's weddings. Yeah. And that was, you know... 50 years ago, they would have had them onto these cine rolls. We'd have to convert them to a DVD. Yep. Um, I finished that job five years ago. Hmm. I don't even have a DVD player, so <laughs> I don't even know what it goes to well, nowadays. I've, days, I've got all of these jumps. DVDs up here, and I spent a good half of last year uh, converting them onto uh, hard drives because exactly. yeah. I, I don't know if the next thing that I'm going to get is, is going to have a, a dvd player so do you find with um with the wedding photography now that people are just expecting you to be able to provide video for it as well uh yes i i think it is um i get where they're coming from like cameras can shoot video and photo right yeah and they would expect you to hop between potentially uh taking photos they go you know you're only you're only providing 500 photos or whatever and you're here for 10 hours so you know Fill that other time with with you know video. Is and is that sort of how long it takes? Or, you know how is because I, I know weddings are like an all day events. How yes. long a time is it for you? How long do you spend doing? Uh, it will be ten to eleven hours right. for the standard day. Right. Uh, I would say a half day, six hours. I'd say oh half day, nice. I'll be back by <laughs> <laughs> back by seven. <laughs> um, they're they're long days. People underestimate how long a sure, day it takes yeah, to shoot. Imagine. But um, and yeah, you do get you do get requests for video, and yeah. I mean, I, I worked with someone, Scott. Um, I worked with him as a videographer with me together. We were supplying photo and video packages. Yeah, our cameras are not alike. <laughs> he had a fully fledged <laughs> cinema camera oh, yeah. that could shoot for two hours. It could do X, Y, and Z that mine couldn't. Yeah, they are two different disciplines using the same kind of equipment. It's interesting. Uh, I've seen a lot yeah. of people talking about, you know, the the new Sony camera, which is only twelve megapixels, and is uh, you know, but uh, it's S4, it's, yeah. it's a video camera. You know, it's for yeah. doing video with. And I don't, I, I we're, we're so used to uh, mirrorless or DSLRs that do video, and we can produce video well with it. I don't think people realise the difference of using a proper camera that's been built to do mm. cine with. Yeah. And I mean, I have the equipment to do video. I have a gimbal, uh, an X-T4 4K camera, microphones, monitors, everything. I have the equipment to do it. But my skill and my training is more in flash photography and posing techniques and client relations. Um, so photography is more my strong suit. I could, I could potentially accompany someone and assist as a videographer, but I wouldn't be comfortable in such a high-pressure situation to do just videography. No, I, I completely understand that. And what I find interesting, actually, is somebody, because I came from um, making short films, wanting to make films, not really wanting to do the video side of it, yeah. that that fits into photography a lot easier than 
jumping from either film or photography to making videos, to making corporate videos, to making that that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm I'm sure it's the same for you know between wedding photos and and, and other things. Um, exactly. So you're there for ten odd hours. How long would an edit be for a for a, a thing like that? Oh, an edit. Okay. Um, so when I started when I started uh, doing kind of uh, weddings, I my first wedding I think took me two months wow. to edit. Okay. Um, I would say that on average, and this is over all the years, I, w- I would have done between two and a half to three thousand photos per event. Right. Over two cameras, many memory cards, um, through the day, and it used to take me a long time to do mm-hmm. because it was a lot of importing, applying a preset, not being happy with the preset, sure. uh, and then once you've chosen your X hundred pictures. Uh, then you've got to try and make them look the same. Mm. So yeah, it, it took me hours and hours and hours the first few times. Then after a few years, I started realizing there were little uh, ways to improve workflow in Lightroom. I, I figured out smart preview rendering and you know uh, hosting pictures without raw files and things like this. And nowadays, a two and a half thousand uh, picture edit down to the 500 or so would probably take me about six hours. If I just went full on, full yeah, out. that's not bad actually. That's, uh... Yeah, but that that is that's the combination of I know where all the keyboard shortcuts are to do every single thing I need to do on yeah. my specifically mapped keyboard. I've got my machine specifically optimized to do raw editing yeah. as fast as physically possible. Yeah, I've been using the same presets for six years in a row, so I know exactly how they interact with every hue and color. Sure, and I can spot when things are starting to change. So I, that's just sheer practice that Pre-sets you can get it down. for someone like me who doesn't you know, do a, a bunch of photos in work, I'll, I'll have, mm. I suppose most I've had is something like 800 photos in a, in a go, and most of those are the same photo because it's wildlife stuff, and one yeah. of them will be in focus. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's a much easier thing to go, well, I'm going to edit each one manually. I, I imagine for you, presets are pretty vital. They are, yes. And I mean, I wouldn't say that I rely on a preset to do all of it, because sure. then my editing would be five minutes. Uh, it's I, I start with a base pack. I primarily use, um, not sponsored by the way, I use um, <laughs> presets by a company called Mastin Labs, who very closely simulate film photography, so Kodak Portra, Fujifilm 400H, yeah, yeah. which I used to develop, so I know what the colours look like uh, back in the printing shop. So I would apply that. And then I would go back and see, okay, this scene was all in the same light, so I can adjust the lighting. And then I go, this scene was all inside, so I know that the the colors will react in different ways. So sure. that might be the shadows have to get dropped. And I kind of do a big preset copy and paste, then several smaller and several smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller. And then you get to the last three hour rush where you're going picture by pitch and you're going crop, spot adjustment, uh, masking this radial Go next, 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 next. Uh, just stopping for coffee. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so with with that in mind, if you, I suppose, if you're starting out, really, what should you be looking at charging for a, for that package for a day mm. at the wedding? Let's say ten, eleven hours, maybe a little bit more, because I know some people, you know, like yeah. to, to spend more time there. Um, uh, maybe a, I, I don't know if you do, I know some wedding photographers will do a kind of a, a pre-shoot, go and see the venue, go and, yeah, 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 all that sort of thing. The, yeah, the engagement shots, the things like that. And then the edit at the end of it. I mean, really, you're talking about two days worth of solid. Two days worth of, of, stuff, of yeah. stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what sort of pricing? Um, the reason I'm asking this is because I'm very much of the mindset mm. of don't undercharge for a service because you actually I, end up hurting the, the industry. Absolutely agree. Uh, so absolutely what, what agree. sort of things would people be charging for that? Yeah, so weddings are a luxury service, right? They are there and they are, they are not going to be charging the base price of their petrol and their minimum wage to do at your event. Yeah. And you see sometimes on Facebook, you, you'll have a photographer and he'll be like, £295 plus an album plus a drone footage <laughs> plus this. And you look at it and you go, that's cheap, which is good for me. Yeah. But why is he so cheap? Now, my very first wedding I ever did was free because I did it as a favour to the person who got me a job at my old shop. Yeah. 
That's how I got my experience. Yeah. My first paid one was £450. Nowadays, that would probably be around £600 with inflation. Okay. I charge over £1,000 for a day photography. Yeah. Um, but there is kind of this, this under a certain bracket, I would say under £500, people are going to be browsing you because of your price, which is not what you want as a photographer. You want people to be browsing because of your style or yes, your uniqueness yes. or your niche or your attitude, whatever. Um, I would say 500 is the absolute bare minimum for a day's photography to charge in this country, 2021. Um, and I would say the comfortable range to charge once you're kind of established, you've done 20, 30, 40 weddings, is 1,000 to 1,500 um, for a package. Because at that point, people go, I'm paying him because he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, he or she, they know exactly what they're doing. They can provide a service without fail. They have backups for everything. Yeah. That thousand pounds is securing um, my happiness for the day because yeah. I know that they are going to not cause problems. <laughs> and that, essentially, that's all they want. They, they just want you to capture the day and not do anything wrong. <laughs> and this it's, sort of comes yeah. into a, a, an area that I've, I think I've talked about on the channel before, which is price anchoring. If you yeah. anchor yourself as a as a cheap solution, you're always going to be a cheap solution. You'll never yeah. be able to sort of jump up to that because people will will, will assume you're the cheap version of a, of a, of a wedding photographer. Uh, exactly. So on the day, what's what are the sort of mistakes that people make, and how do you avoid mistakes? Mm. What are the things that you know? This has gone wrong in the past. It will go wrong again. What do I do to mitigate it? So I think uh, the mistake of early wedding photographers is to focus on taking photos of static objects. It, it, it sounds weird, but it makes sense. So um, when, you, when you're doing a wedding, you're taking photos of guests, preparations, timely events, uh, sure. a wedding cake, all this kind of stuff. And I've seen so many um, newer kind of wedding photographers and... 50% of their entire delivered package will be a picture of the table, a picture of the outside of the building, a picture of things that aren't moving. And the reason right. why they're doing it is because it's easy to do. It doesn't move. Yeah. You can get the settings right. Not going to change. So, um, and if you think about what the kind of the, the, the couple want, they don't want 250 photos of what the room looks like. They want 250 photos of your guests meeting each other and having yeah, fun sure. and talking to each other and getting ready and things like that. So a lot of people put too much emphasis on the preparation style side of things rather than the guests and the entertainment and the, the connection with people meeting each other. So that's, a, that's kind of the first one. The second one is going into uh, wedding photography without any kind of um, personal interaction skills, uh, personable savvy uh it's all about on the wedding day it's kind of all about being almost like a friend um you're not just a hired caterer you're not just a vendor just there to snap you're there mm -hmm. to be liked you're there to fearlessly talk to people you're there to gather up crowds to do group shots to have a chat with you know the uncle who's got a dsl out at home and he wants to have a you know he's interested in your gear or yeah, something yeah, yeah. It's about being liked because if you want those um, referrals and you want those people to pass on the good word, you have to be liked as as a person. Um, sure. And I think a lot of people go into it not thinking that's a skill and they should just sit in the corner and tape snaps. You can do that, but it's not going to help your career in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we've talked about editing. We've talked about Lightroom before. Presumably you lose, use Lightroom. Yes. Do you use Photoshop at all? And if, if so, what are the things that, that mm. make you move on to Photoshop rather than Lightroom? Um, I only use Lightroom probably 0.1% of the time. So I right. will do right. nearly everything that is humanly possible in Lightroom. And then right. I will flag up with uh, either stars or color ratings, pictures that need to go into Photoshop. And these would be uh, composites, panoramas, uh, things where the spot removal can't remove something that big, and you'll need to use the um, spot remover in Photoshop to kind of the healing tools. Healing, the yeah, they do a lot better job. Spend hours and hours with those tools. But uh, <laughs> the, the majority, the majority of things that you you have to remove are just things like um, 
fire alarm bells and exit signs and things like that, right. which you can just you know spot remove five seconds. Um, but yeah, I would. I mean, I I did a I did a wedding where to do the group shot there was two hundred people, and they mm -hmm. wanted to do it standing up, and I couldn't get above the kind of the, the height of people to get a down shot. So I literally, I spread them out uh, throughout uh, a, probably a 30 meter long line. And I said, everybody, oh, right, I'm going to be taking like six shots in a row. So I went, D -d 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 and again, the second pass. And I just stitched them all together into this huge panoramic, a bit like a school photo. Um, those yeah. are the kind of times I would use Photoshop, but nearly all the time it's Lightroom. We don't have much longer left. Um, I do have one uh, more question, sure. which I've forgotten, so I'll have to look at the little <laughs> thing I've got down here, which tells me what my questions are. Uh, we So we talked about um, uh, Lightroom presets and, and everything like that. Um, when you're there, when you're on, on the day, on the shoot, yeah. um, do you find that you do the same sort of shots again and again and again, or do you try and mix it up and do something new for each wedding mm. or, or what? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, you don't, well, you've got to get a, an X amount of reliable shots. Shots you know exactly how they're going to work. If you're using flash, you know that this combination or this pairing of lighting will provide a certain shot. You want to take them. If you are going to try something new, you want to ideally have practiced it beforehand with like models yep. or at home if, you, if it's non-moving. Um, do you, do, I'd say, yeah, interest, absolutely. do you set up lights and then let them, um, you know, let people stand in particular locations and take shots like that as well as doing everything else around the day? Yeah, I, I use uh, lighting quite a lot. Uh, now I will do things like, um, pin lighting, which is lighting someone very close and then removing the light stand in post-production, taking like two mm. shots. Uh, I'll use almost spotlights, so kind of first dance, I'll have two huge three meter stands, lights on the top, controlled by a trigger. I can turn them on and off and power adjustments. Uh, so yeah, I do use them through the day, but uh, right. yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, something that I incorporate. It's, it's part of my style to, to put flash in. And, then, and, so, and so what about the, the rest of it? Do, yeah. do you, are there certain, I, I was watching a show the other day and it, it has a photographer and obviously every time somebody dramatizes a job, they get it wrong in some way, shape or form. Yeah. But they, they were a photographer and they were taking a wedding and it was, oh, now we have to do this shot and then this shot. And then the, is, is that very much what, what you, you do? You know, you have a package of shots that you, um, you like to use or uh, do you try and do something different each time? I or? try, um, I try and, push myself and kind of get better versions of previous right. style shots. I will always okay. take the safe ones first. But uh, sure. as, as it comes, if I had like a list and I said I need to get this shot, then this shot. Weddings are fluid. Times change. People change locations. Things can happen 20 minutes before they're scheduled to. So you may miss certain things. Yeah. Um, what I, the approach I take is I will capture anything which I feel is important to the couple, means something yeah. to them. So if they've, you know, changed, uh, let's say, the, the cutlery uh, for the meal. That's maybe a reason why I did it. I'll snap that. If they're going to have their father come in and meet the bride before they go down, I would have asked that question to find out if that's the thing already. And minutes before the, the, the father comes in, I would lock the door and tell him not to come in. <laughs> Move everything out the room, push everything back. I'd say, look, he's yep. going to come in. You stand there. This is going to happen. I kind of let it flow. So it's kind of a little bit of pushing and prodding, getting things into a way that it looks good on a picture. Sure. And they, they sure. should trust you with your instincts of, I yeah. believe this will come out the best if we try this. Uh, and it's not being you know too pushy. So yeah, it's uh, keep the safe shots, but also just push just a little bit further each time. Cool. Oh. Well, that's it for this particular video. Thanks ever so much to John. Thank you very much for coming along. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and thank you to you for watching as well. If you've liked what you've seen, then please do uh, give the video a thumbs up. And if you've got any uh, questions for John uh, about wedding photography, do leave them in the comments. We may very well do another video like this at some point. 
or other videos. I don't know. Um, uh, but yes, leave a comment as well uh, if you if you've liked the video. If you're brand new here, click on the subscribe button, the little bell icon at the end, and of course choose all notifications from the thing that comes up, and that way you won't miss any videos that I put out over the coming weeks. You'll find John's uh, link to John's channel in uh, the link links below um, and I'll probably put up one of those fancy end screen things in a minute as well but until then thanks ever so much for coming along I'll see you next time and don't forget keep taking those photos <laughs>